still early here. <laughs> yeah, I can't fathom that. I'm on like literally the, the other side of the world. Yeah. It's yeah. dark yeah. here. I think uh, I think at one p.m. here. I don't know. Yeah, one p.m. On your side, bro. It's one p.m. One p.m. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mark, it's it's nine, right? It's nine a.m. Nine a.m. where I am. Yeah. <laughs> so this is how you start uh, your Tuesday every two weeks. That's pretty much yeah. A, a, a run wow. with the dog. And then sit down here and talk about stuff. <laughs> what a good way to start a day. <laughs> it's nice. It's yeah. nice. It's good. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's it's like daylight here, but still dark because it's Vancouver and the sun comes out. Actually, I shouldn't say that. It was really nice all weekend, but most of the time it's dark and kind of rainy. So, <laughs> and this morning is just kind of gray. It would be hard. It would be hard to tell just by looking out the window that it's daytime. Mm. Yeah, it was kind of like this today here in Switzerland. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, it could get that way in Switzerland in the winter too. It can get all fogged in, get all yeah low, low cloud cover, and then they all like drive up to altitude to get above the clouds and sit in the sun in the mountains. Yes, yes, like all the, the yeah, all the winter. I was, I mean, I was literally in, in the fog where I live. Like I couldn't see more than like five meters mm -hmm. all day <laughs> for about two months. It was like that. And uh, and if you want sun, you want to, you need to go, yeah, high. <laughs> yeah. You drive up through the fog on little mountain roads with, insufficient barriers and blind yeah. corners and then all of a sudden you pop out the top and yeah you have to honk you know with your yeah. with your car if, when you do a turn because you're never sure if someone else is coming in from the other side right. uh yeah like with the truck <laughs> too big for you <laughs> yeah yeah so, so um, I don't know if, uh, do you know, Diana, if, if, uh, Kazi will, will join? She said she will, uh, but I'm not sure. She either might be late or she might have okay. got stuck in some extra work. Uh, yeah, we've been battling our empathy map so much. If, you know, like once we publish it, you'll see what we've been going through. <laughs> suffering we put in there. So. That's a that's a good sign. Yeah, I mean that's what <laughs> empathy is about. Let's let's suffer together. <laughs> yeah. Oh. There we go. There we go. Crazy. We're waiting for you. Hi. 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 Sorry, I uh, lost the link. <laughs> Took me a while to find it. Yeah, yeah. The, the meetup link is gone. Really? Yeah, it's a four hundred four. Oh shite. Uh, yeah. Okay. I, I did. You know what? I did copy link address from the <laughs> from the meetup um, page, and uh, I don't know why he the meetup want to localize the. You know, he had like uh, it adds automatically. Like EU uh, Austria, Austria, I don't know what to the link, and sometimes it doesn't work. I, I just don't know why. He wants to redirect to like the European side of Meetup. Yeah, it's okay. better. When I click today, it just took me straight into this room, and usually I get you know sent to the lobby, and then I make my choice. So I just yeah, the because they they changed the um, invite link from Kumo Space, and now we can add the link directly to the room before you you were um, you know required to go through the lobby, and now you you can go directly to the room. And <clears throat> um, I tried another meetup last week, and I clicked to the Kumo Space link, 
and I expected to to you know to arrive on the lobby at in the lobby, and I came directly in the room and I was not ready, you know, the, the, the camera was not set up properly, like it was facing on top and stuff like that. I said, oh, shit. And, uh, and as the sound of the room is, you know, you can hear everyone speaking, <laughs> people heard me like, uh, you know, saying bad words. And I just entered and I said, merde, <laughs> in French, <laughs> like shit. <laughs> was a nice way to say hello. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, who's there? Hello. Hey. Move to the top. Hello. Come and join. The table. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how to use it. Yeah. Yeah. So you can, if you have, I don't know where. If you are in a computer, you you can just click around and it moves you. And if you're on your smartphone, I guess if you touch anywhere in the space, you, you can move. Oh, there yeah. you go. Yeah. <laughs> cool. yeah it's, it's nice to see new faces. Welcome, Jared. <laughs> so. Cool. Um, kind of a 2D version of a, of a 3D space. It's cool. Sorry? I was just saying it's a, it's a 2D version of a 3D space. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Never tried uh, Kumo Space before? Uh, no, this platform? I tried no. Space. Okay. Cool. Where's everyone dialing in from? I am in, uh, I'm dialing in from the Netherlands. So I'm in Holland. I'm here from Brazil. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm from Romania. I, I, yeah, so less exotic. I'm from Canada, from the West Coast. <laughs> and I'm from Switzerland. Wow. And you? It's very exotic. <laughs> I'm in uh, California. Welcome. <laughs> Which part of California are you in? Uh, North Northern California. Okay. Near Napa. <laughs> yeah, it's nice to to have like uh, people coming from. Yeah, very different places. It's nice. Yeah, there was a um, an app I saw that I think it was with On Deck where they you could see you could place a pin where you were located on a map. Uh, sorry, I, I don't get it. Oh, uh, I think it was on deck. I was on a on a preliminary call with on deck, and they they had a map, and you could place a, a pin where you're, where you're at in your name. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, we could try this with a uh, with a mirror a mirror board next time, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> You'll have to find the. It's on LinkedIn. If I think if you type in on deck and you just look through the different stream, there's a one of the streams is a picture of, of the map program they used. Okay. Cool. So and what's the um, yeah. what's the like the topic or the agenda or? What, so whatever usually the we don't have any we don't have any specific agenda for for the virtual shadow sessions. It's more like informal discussion with whatever we have in mind. Usually. Uh, now we 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 uh, had a, a session um, two weeks ago, something like that, um, where we did a workshop to see what would be the next kind of topic we would like to to tackle with the community, and uh, we came out with uh, like a very broad topic about the place of well, the role of designers in society and what does it mean to become better designers. And and so we were thinking of maybe trying, well, we, we were thinking of trying something today, um, like um, starting from a, a keyword to see where we 
we where we go from from this from this point what we what we understand by this word and where we go from this point um but maybe before that i don't know mark if you want to bring up some background with what you did recently yeah so so part of the issue with a lot of the conversations in and around design is that you spend a lot of time, you know, kind of defining the terms, right? And, and, and I think I, and I wrote this on what we were working on was that you get into this kind of semantic tug of war over, you know, what this means and what that means. And it's not necessarily productive to, you know, asking deeper questions. And so what if we took the approach of, picking a really broad definition of design, something that a lot of, or some, some statement that a lot of people are familiar with that casts a really wide net. And that statement that we were thinking about using was the Herbert Simon statement. Um, I'll read it off here. To design is to de devise courses of action aimed at changing existing situations into preferred ones, right? So the, the nice thing about that is that it, it doesn't tie it down necessarily to like a profession or a discipline or anything like that, it's a course of action. And that course of action involves um, creating material change in the world, um, looking to the future, essentially, you know, building for the future, um, and, and not necessarily just kind of positing that future, but actually proposing courses of action that is, that is materializing that future, right? And so if, if that is a kind of a domain of design of materializing the future, and we can kind of accept that, then there is a place for us to sit with that and say, well, what does it mean to become a better designer with like underneath those terms, right? So how, how do we become better at, you know, uh, materializing a future? And that can mean any, that can mean something to everybody in their own way, pan-disciplinary, but there's also a notion in there that there is, that there are two levels to this. One is that, that there is a, common domain of design across disciplines in addition to specific disciplinary knowledge right and so an example of that might be and i don't know, put it in here i'll read right off of here if i can um, so the thing to consider is that by any definition design is both a generalized human activity as well as a set of specific professions and disciplines that is to say we can ask questions about design we can inquire how it pertains to specific disciplines like the techniques of a given medium um, for example, understanding the strength of materials with regards to furniture design or gestalt principles as they pertain to poster design. Um, but we can also ask questions about those aspects of design that fall under the auspices of a generalized human activity, right? It's kind of the idea. <coughs> Pardon me. And so, and so if, we, if we can accept that we have that kind of generalized definition, um, is there a common uh, domain of design around materializing this future. Oh, you've got the black, the black white version. So this is the very draft <laughs> version of a kind of a manifesto that we're, that we're working on. Um, yeah. And, and the idea is, so how do we kind of get better at that? And to extract a little bit from that, talking about these sessions and talking about what people hope to get out of them, some of it is this kind of, this notion that you'd like to be better at what it is that you do after having these conversations, somehow feel enlightened. Uh, hang on, I'm just gonna move this over because when Kevin shared his screen, I can now no longer see people. No. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry for that. No, that's okay, I just gotta... Um, ah. And I'm sorry, Jared, I, I just don't know how it looks like on, on, on a, a smartphone, but it's, <laughs> It sounds like not intuitive at all. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. Yeah, that's right, yeah. In, in, in any case, that was a bit of a, a rambling thing, but you get the kind of idea of where we're going. And I think it's it's rambling because this is the first draft of something that was written on Sunday night very late, um, trying to um, put shape to a conversation that we had that was pretty um, loose, let's yeah. just say. Yeah. Right. So. So yeah, so this is this is the first attempt at kind of putting that together. Now, the the way that we were thinking, the way we were thinking of giving this structure beyond kind of what's written there was to have was to think back to Sesame Street and the electric company and like when something was brought to you by the letter A or the number 
what, seven or something like that, mm -hmm. can we have these sessions and have them brought to us by a word? <clears throat> and for a couple of different reasons, the word that we were thinking about for the first conversation, which is this one here, is the word actionable. Um, one, the word actionable, like, <clears throat> popped up, <clears throat> pardon me, for me, all over the place. It was following me around. And the other one is, is that it's an A, and starting with the letter A kind of makes sense for mm -hmm. some strange <laughs> <laughs> Sesame Street uh, electric company related reason. Um, but yeah, so, so what does it mean for something to be actionable, right? And I was looking at it because there were books that were popping up and other things like, you know, actionable UX and, and um, other terms. I'm trying to remember what they all were. Actionable gamification, actionable, they, like they just kind of popped up into my face. And so if this is about materializing the future, right? Like making material, a conception of the future um, that is preferable to the current condition, um, then somewhere there's a connection between that and the word actionable. And so what, is, what does actionable mean in that context? Mm -hmm. And so as you can see, it's loose, but might start something, which is really all that we want is a spark to start a conversation. <laughs> and if I may add yeah. uh, for the newcomers, because it may take you by surprise <clears throat> why we're doing that. So the community existed for more than a year already, and we stayed in this exploratory mode for quite some time. But we observe that there is something common among all of the people that come and go in this forum, which really culminated in this sentence that Mark shared. How can we, once we leave the session, be better designers? So mm -hmm. what we wanted to experiment this year going forward is to have these keywords like actionable in this session that we would stay on for one or two of these um, discussions and see where does this take us and hopefully through this collaborative exchange with you and the others that are going to join we will actually complete this manifesto and we would create something that uh, people can relate to and also help us take the next step because we're kind of in the middle this was the beginning that mark shared but we want to go forward so um that's where we are at the moment more or less on the journey <laughs> So it's a little messy, but like any design, it's never straight line. So there, there's a this, one of the, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I was just going to say one of the conferences I attended, what they did is they had it like this, where it was a, you know, kind of like a free for all free form. But then they had one of the one of the uh, attendees was a sketching visually the conversation. So they got like a visual and uh, a text. So that was kind of interesting, too. Yeah, so I am creating um, a board yes, right now. I was just going to point out that you're yeah. building a mural board as we speak. Yes, so so I will share the link right now, and uh, and so we can. I, I will try my best to to capture everything that is said during the session, anyway. But if you can, like. Um, yeah, input some some of your thoughts there as the session goes. It it would really help. Um, Can I ask something? Yes. Uh, Go ahead. Just for the language barrier, because I'm I'm not native. I'm not English native. Uh, can we define actionable in the? <laughs> what? But does I, I would I would like to ask you what it sounds like for you? What it what would it mean to you when you hear that term? I, I'm not you know uh, English is not my native language at, uh, as well, so I understand the the, the question. But like, what does it sounds like for you? Something actionable? Mm, I was uh, I did a really quick research to see what would look like in Portuguese. So we have a, we have a, a word that is litigável. And, okay. the, and the word, uh, the word has, the definition is something that can be con uh, contestated. Hmm. Okay. 
Is that is that it? <laughs> Guys, don't hesitate soon to 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 come in and and say what you have in mind about that. I was almost thinking. Um, I'm trying. I think it was called uh, Hyperion. It was a novel in a series that, and they had a one of the one of the groups I was a part of. They used it as a model of like manifest procreation. What they would do with houses connected by like tubes and stuff kind of like you know, how the internet and zoom and we're all connected and they would try to like create um like futures basically like you know modeling potential actions that you could take mm -hmm. and how the world would look differently and how it would look differently between people like if this person did this how would it affect these other people yeah I think I got it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, I, I just brought up the um, the Oxford Dictionary definition, and there's two kind of branches to it. One is legal, giving sufficient reason to take legal action, and the other one is able to be done or acted on, having practical value. And I think that in the realm that the book titles and blog posts and everything else that peppered my um, experience for a couple of weeks. I think the second one is the one that that we were taught that people are talking about. So actionable UX would mean um, UX that is not purely theoretical, but meant to have some kind of practical value or something like that. But I do find, you know, it's almost like um, when they, when we start using words like monetize instead of, you know, make money or, you know, something like that, that, that it's, it's taken on a, um, a, almost like a persona within the design community in terms of something being actionable. Hmm. So I guess, I guess the question, the question then is what are the components of, um, what would, it, what would it mean for a conversation within our group to be actionable? What would it mean for a concept to be actionable? I think we need to, <clears throat> we need to understand that in the same way. In other words, somehow that the priorities and the expectations are not too far away because uh, the bigger the gap, uh, I think there is a danger of uh, this paralysis. Therefore, you don't necessarily see the practical value. That's how I would think. Small steps. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think I can relate. I work uh, with uh, social media for some time now. And that is <clears throat> in Brazil, that is uh, a state of mind about social media that is starting to be actionable. It was not before that we don't know what, what, what we were doing and what we are, we are just, it, it was just, uh, graphic designers and, and marketing people and and people discovering something that uh, is a new concept uh, for for what we do for a living. And that I I think I can draw this line where we can say something is actionable after something uh, just we have a social comprehension of it. <clears throat> mm -hmm. I like this idea. I think uh, I was actually thinking about the leading to action, but actually it's more something that it's 
can be can materialize into an action, something that is actionable. It's action able. It's able to withstand a certain capacity for action. And mm -hmm. it's usually when you see it happening, it's sometimes something actionable is seen in retrospect. You can hypothesize, hypothesize to like to, to think of, oh, this path can lead to action, but actually you will see it as actionable you know, when you look back and you saw the concrete steps you could take, because otherwise any actionable plan that you have in mind is not really an action in itself until it's concrete. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I say here a catalyst for action in, in, the, in the same lines as Diana said. Yeah, I, I, to me, it begs the question, what is not actionable, you know, what would be something not actionable? It's like, could anything can be, yeah, could anything be actionable in some way? I think anything that carries a lot of ambiguity and lack of clarity is very difficult to act upon because you, mm. it, it creates a lot of, uh, you, you're loading it with a lot of assumptions and therefore uh, you're kind of afraid that your actions would be wasted because if the expectations are for something else, then why would I move if I know that mm -hmm. uh, probably I'm I'm going to waste my energy and, and effort and time? I yeah. saw on there the word persona. That was a pretty good... Um, there's, I think there's actually a, a movie called Persona and it talks about like the hiring process and like um, personality testing, all that kind of stuff. You could ask, uh, even apply to communities though, like what kind of community members are there or what kind of community person do you draw to you and how are they served or how, are you, how do you serve them? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Almost like what, if you had a community, what would be like the theme or you know, like the branding, the, what would it be known for? The other thing that comes to mind, sorry, to just to finish on the what is not actionable. I think that if you perceive that the action carries a lot of risk for failure or uncertainty, it's probably paralyzing at the initial stages for you to, to move forward because, yeah. No, you don't want to immediately jump into the abyss. So uh, this illusion that the action should almost should not result in a failure, I think, is important to make it actionable. Yeah, I, I personally had something in mind, but I don't. Uh, I don't find the the word uh, anymore. Um, but you know, it's like the discussion around uh, the, the movie Don't Look Up, uh, the, the, the emotion that it, that it calls, that the, um, the fact that there's some kind of uh, fatality about what is happening and, and it sounds too big to, to do anything about it, you know? This kind of state is uh, but I, I there's a word for that but i just don't remember it so, sorry uh but i would yeah i would find this this emotion emotional state to be or uh, whatever leads to this emotional state to be something not actionable you might find uh... apathy. sorry kevin sorry apathy yeah some kind of apathy, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a good word. Thank you. There's Go ahead, a, An author called, his name is Michael Drew, and he does, he does like, uh, that's authorship and stuff, but he does, um, has a thing called The Pendulum, and it talks about the different generations that we live in and how 
a lot of times it starts with small actions lead to bigger results. Like if a community sees something that's too tremendous, they're like, there's just no way they can't even comprehend it. They just walk away. But if you approach it from a small, like community mm-hmm. scale, it, it kind of makes sense. Kind of like, you know, trash, you know, like, you know, how are you going to clean up all the trash on the planet? But if you just say, well, pick up one piece a day when I'm doing seat walking around. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Is it the BG Fog, the guy who wrote the book you talked about? Yeah, um, it might have been. I just know. I just know that illustration or familiarity from from the other author. Okay. Because he, you know, he's the guy behind um, the MIT um, Behavioral uh, Research Lab, and his work is uh, something that drove the um, Uh, what is the name? The like the product thinking type of uh, thinking in Silicon Valley um, about uh, you know and and one of the his students created the hook model. Maybe you you heard of this model, and um, it is heavily in- inspired of his model, which is the fog model. And um, what? Could yeah. Be. And and this guy wrote a book about uh, tiny steps uh, for for. Re- for sustainable change. But it's more like at a personal level, right? It's, it's less about like um, moving the masses, you know? <laughs> it's more about your personal life, how to change, how to change your behavior. Yeah, because I mean, from a, like a company perspective, they can do more, but a lot of times, well, who's the company talking to? Usually they're talking to their customers. so. The customers can't do what the company can do. <laughs> <laughs> True. True, and at the same time, they expect uh, you know customers to change behavior, so they can change <laughs> their behavior. <laughs> It's kind of uh, the wrong feedback loop. <laughs> I was almost thinking sometimes it's like it's kind of like when a company provides some kind of. Um, education or lead magnet or ebook or something like they're providing some kind of like context or education or support system around whatever it is they're trying to initiate sometimes that helps hmm. what about the the other way when you act before you know so there are a lot of situations that make you kind of put you in in this position where you have to act in the uncertainty. You don't know enough, so you have to go out into the world and be prepared to make mistakes and move around, make a lot of noise, use a lot of energy in action so you can you know, gather enough knowledge and go back to, to uh, understanding certain things. So maybe there's something to say about the, the action before research because you, you mm-hmm. sort of need to gather some empirical momentum before you understand what you want to do. And I think that's what freezes the community sometimes, because we're trying to get this clarity and figure out the right way, and we get stuck and come back uh, to, to figure out this, what is the designer, because we have such little clarity. It's such a big concept and so problematic uh, in so many ways. But uh, I think we just haven't found our path to action before understanding it. Hmm. Uh, I was thinking about, I was reading the, the mirror. So I was thinking about how, and, and Diana complimented my, my thought, but uh, I was thinking how could we, sorry, I got lost, really lost. <laughs> no worries, Go. take your time. So when I was I'm doing research for a job, uh, I start to, I start, I start to take my time and do, uh, very broad research and 
then I got to a scope, then I do a broad research again, then I got to a scope, a broad research again. So uh, I think the design, the design way of thinking to be actionable is a circle. Like you, every, every research you do, you need to go back to the start again with more knowledge to, to read again and think about, about the, the things you, you're doing uh, in the research and go back again and go back again and go back again. Then when you have the knowledge you think you want, you start, you start doing action about, uh, upon the, the research. I think this is the practical way I, in my head to understand what's actionable or not. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I used to be in the, like the product mindset, you know, what can I build or make? And then when I realized that that wasn't very, it wasn't like producing a lot of results or actionable information, I just started having conversations and I just started going to events or communities and just started talking to people and listening. And I got way more insight and way more progress than trying to like build something in isolation. It just, it's just better to have the feedback, whatever it is. I mean, I think Bruno touches on something that I think is particular to design in that design builds knowledge during the process of designing, right? That the more that you work on something, the more you understand about it. And I think it is, it is particular in that design actually happens in the specific situations that you work on a problem, you work on a thing. And if you work on something over time, the context in which you're inserting your product app poster, whatever it is that you're doing changes the context, right? So this is kind of like a real life kind of feedback mechanism that happens. If you build a new app, and that app starts to change behavior and you're working on that app over time, the, that change in behavior is something you need to take into account as you are continuing to design the app, right? So there's this kind of feedback loop that happens that, that actually creating something in the world builds new knowledge because it changes the context, right? And so design as an activity is actually a knowledge building activity in and of itself. And so what Bruno points to is really interesting in that, that every loop brings not only effect in the world, but new information, right, or new behavior. So I think it's a, it, that's a really, that is something that is specific to design knowledge, which is one of the tabs that I put in there, which is, okay, well, so, you know, what do we need to know to move forward? What's actionable? Well, what is design knowledge, mm -hmm. right? Can we actually turn that into something and say design knowledge is a particular kind of knowledge that is a combination of um, intuition, judgment, um, qualitative and quantitative feedback from the context that we're working in. You know, there's a whole, there's a whole complex system that happens as you make something and put it into the world. Right. And yeah, I, I would say this, there's also something specific to this knowledge type of knowledge is that it, it has, um, um, validity in time. It's like, it's like, it's not like any kind of knowledge that you could create and you know it can last in it can last like sometimes most of the time design knowledge is 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 valid until a certain point where it's not useful anymore which is not the same kind of knowledge than science sees sorry sciences can create mm -hmm. Well, you can look at one of the places that that becomes really evident is in the difference of the notion of experimentation in science and design, mm -hmm. right? So a really good design experiment is proven out if you run it 10 times and you get the same result. That is a valid kind of scientific experiment. Yeah. You run a design experiment 10 times and the opposite should potentially happen, that you generate 10 different ideas or you you generate knowledge that is less specific and more diffuse 
and somehow leads to multiple options, right? So you're not, you're not proving something that is fixed in a way you are discovering something that is not. Yeah. Right. Which I think is really kind of, I think the experimentation, the definition of experimentation in those two contexts is tied to the difference in the knowledge in those two contexts or the definition of knowledge in those two contexts. Mark, I was, I was reading about uh, design and methodology, uh, focus on a project. And I have the, the book right here. It's a Brazilian book. It was written by uh, some, some of the uh, really great professors of universities and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. And it's funny how they first, in the book, they first uh, lay a historical path about methodology and research and how the engineers wa uh, was, the engineer science was uh, thinking, how do we uh, research and how do we uh, construct a methodology to the market because our methodology is not working to sell a product and to to bring something that it's uh consume uh, consumer uh valuable so it's really about how design uh, then design comes up with this crazy idea that we need to focus on the, the focus, the research and how we think uh, to in the, in the consumer, then we can bring back the feedback and go it in, go again and go again and go again. And the repetition would bring the, the results. And uh, it, it's about the action you take and uh, the toughing process after that and the action you take and the toughing process after that. So it's like, for me, design have this idea that we can we need to act upon something, then think about it, then act again and think about. It. So it's this repetition that creates something new and creates uh, something innovative. Uh, Bruno, were you searching for iterative? What, sorry. I was just thinking it sounded like you were searching for iterative, you know, like doing something over and over again, trying to see what, what, what kind of result you get. No, I was uh, searching about uh, design methodology. So how we, how we research and how everything works uh, before we take action and, and bring some product to the market or something like that. So if you want to, if you want to, I couldn't understand exactly what you say, but if you want to, uh, took me in the chat, if you have a link or something like that. Yeah, so, I, I um, think, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, John. Uh, well, I was saying that I think Jared wanted to, to say that the, what you described as a methodology is, is called, um, um, iterative process where you iterative try process. yeah it is an iterative process because you 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 have a set of you know phases where you you test things then you analyze what is what comes out of the test and and then you digest it you you do changes and you do a test again and you repeat this the the same process it is iterative pro, uh, design yeah okay yeah, I think is it correct, like, Chad? This is what you, you meant, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, I think it's that. And uh, uh, it's like really common in Brazil 
So we have this this type of, of process in our design scopes. Mm -hmm. It's it's what we are taught about to to do a great design. You have to research and think, research and think, mm -hmm. act, research, act, research, and think again. So it's it's really how uh, it's my background in design is this type of research. Yeah. yeah, I think it is actually widely shared as a as a practice in in I mean in many countries as a as a good uh, practice for for design. I do think it's not necessarily the only one uh, because. It is, you know, it, it is a narrow, narrowing uh, process where you reduce the options and you go into the, um, uh, you, you do a funnel type of uh, process where you reduce each time the ambiguity and you go into more clear, uh, in a more clear uh, situation. The issue with that is that you, you, you have to select early an option, and by doing that, you uh, become enabled to choose another option while you are going down this uh, this process because you already invested too much in selecting this option and researching this option that you hide. By definition, you hide your from your view all the other possibilities that you could have chosen. So I don't say it's not something that you should do. It's just that it's one of the criticism we can make about this type of iterative process. This is a really good point that you bring, that maybe there is a step before anything becomes actionable. Because the minute you get into this course of actions, you better be sure that what you're acting upon actually is uh, meaningful and relevant. Otherwise... Uh, as you say, you may narrow your net too early and mm -hmm. then go down with this tunnel vision. So I wonder how can we call this step prior to the action to become actionable? Um, hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, by the way, this, this, uh, this process of uh, narrowing down the options, it's called uh, premature convergence. And it's something known in... I think it's in bio evolution. I think it's about you know uh, having diversity in the population and the fact that at some point one feature of of one species can be selected and become uh, f uh, become the only option in the species, and uh, it's the the beginning of the end for the species because it might it might not have enough uh, diversity in the population to be able to adapt to um, uh, unforeseen situation and uh, and therefore it cannot adapt to the to the new context so it i think it's coming from from there if i remember well uh, what, what is it it's premature what convergence yeah yeah go ahead chad could you I was going to say, could you um, do like a sentiment analysis on like the reaction to something as a way to gauge if it was meaningful or insightful or if people cared about it? Hmm. It's like having a prior uh, weight to the to an idea, something like that. Yeah, because there's a um, an application. I think it's called. I don't remember. Um, I, have, I have a book called The Unnoticed Entrepreneur, and he, and he mm -hmm. gives such he gives um, software that you can use, and you could just send it out there into the, you know, the all everything that's being produced out there, and you can see who's being mentioned. You can see anger, sadness, happiness. You can see like why things are happening the way they are from like an emotional human perspective, rather than a machine perspective. And it kind of you can kind of gauge then how to go forward and be heard from there. Hmm. It's 
interesting. I don't I don't know if we because I I I, I presuming like the way we go from there with you know like a sentiment analysis like we will we might think or assume that the most positive type of reaction is necessarily the one that we are looking for and I don't know if it is necessarily the case. But that doesn't mean that it's, it's not necessarily uh, a bad thing to do a sentiment analysis. But I'm just saying, I don't I don't know if if it's necessarily a good thing to. You mentioned adaptability. Yeah. Um, would that be like in terms of paradigms or constructs? And like for me, what helps me, helps me be adaptable is that sometimes I almost try to view things as like you're on the holodeck, right? You're on a like Star Trek or something. Everything's mm -hmm. kind of just being created in real time. It could vanish just the same. So if everything is just being created in real time, anything can change. It, it just helps me be more adaptable in, in, a, in, a, in a given situation. Mm -hmm. And how do you link that to the sentiments or the emotions right um well like if you were like you know out there there's there's like vr stuff and ar and all that information and data being being streamed you could i think there's even us a, 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 a company called emerge and they're trying to merge emotion into like you can feel other people's emotions as you, in real time from a great distance and so like you could if you were creating something, maybe you had an event that you were hosting or you had a product or a service that you were, or it could just be a gathering and you could see, like, you know, like if people go to a game, for instance, right? You hear like the chords, crowds roaring or, you know, or, you know, hooting for their team. So you can kind of, kind of tell where people's emotions and whether um, their motivations are. Mm -hmm. And from a machine perspective, you can't really see that as much, but from like a more human perspective, kind of, kind of like human design, I guess. You would know what they were, what the, um, how your actions would create change before, almost beforehand, because it seems, I guess if you were dealing with machines, it'd be fine. But if you're dealing with people, it just seems like emotions seem to be like, that. that's the epitome of the human condition. We're emotional creatures. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Um, that's a good question. I'm so just, it, I'm just it, thinking. Sorry, Diana. Go ahead. I'm just gonna quickly ask a question. Is yeah. it simulation? That's action is simulating the action. Action because I'm thinking about mirror neurons. You know, when you see mm -hmm. someone do something, and your brain is kind of fired up to you know, take action when you're not taking action, but you're interpreting as action. So what, what does that entail? Taking action without actually taking action. I, I do that as well. Um, like if I want to get really good at something, I'll simulate it over and over and over again until I get the right result. Kind of like if you were going to fly a plane or do something beforehand that you knew was kind of maybe risky, you could at least try it beforehand and then see if it works. And then when you get it for real, at least you know that you've done your best versus just flying blind. There is a certain notion of confidence that comes with before something becomes unactionable. Like you were just talking about this level of simulation to kind of imagine almost or anticipate uh, impact. So do we, do we think that this type of uh, confidence is important aspect of actionable. So I was uh, sorry, uh, I don't want to stray away from the conversation to the, the point. But I was thinking about uh, I was hearing you guys and thinking about metaverse and how things in the metaverse will would start before it gets out gets out to to the universe the practical universe so it's a thing i i couldn't 
I couldn't uh, take it away from my mind that what is actionable when we are uh, we have these conversations here in the internet and we are doing a board and it's that actionable that we are doing some, something or we are pre-action something in here. It, it does help with analysis paralysis. So like if you're analyzing things to like the ninth degree and you're not getting anywhere, sometimes it's almost like you're a, a person or someone is afraid to take action because they don't know what's going to happen. But if you simulate it over and over again, like, like you were mentioning, Bruno, with the iteration, you can see potentially what could occur over and over again until you get a result that you're kind of searching for or the, the process is supposed to happen. And then take action and then not be afraid. So you're like the whole, for me at least, it erases the analysis paralysis. It seems funny to me that we went to the the, the metaverse and uh, and VR and, and stuff like that. And it sounds interesting to me, the fact that when we think of those subjects, we think in terms of something like if, like a product or the service as Jared mentioned or about the metaverse or something like that. Because I, I don't know if, if things that are actionable are necessarily things like actual things that, that were designed with the intent of being actionable. They happen to be actionable, but um, I would be inclined to think that it is because of context and environment than more than their specific features. I don't know. This is one of my question uh, of my points. I think it's like the affordance of the of the environment uh, to, to you know to 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 make us act. And something that I find interesting is to come back to this uh, topic of emotions. I do think that negative emotions are more actionable than positive ones. And this was where I was going with the question before, Jared, about positive emotions. <laughs> but uh, and, and they are not actionable because of the of the features, because because of the context they are they appear in. Maybe. Just a question. Do you are you talking about like like the the pull and the push between ple pleasure and pain? How usually people respond to pain better than really respond to pleasure? Yes, and the fact that um, that we remember very well negative experiences much more than positive ones, and the fact that negative stories are so stories that tend to be negative are easier to remember and make us act in the sense of avoiding the type of outcomes that the story tells us, you know, something like that. Kind of like a, the moral of the story at the end. Yeah, of the... the moral of the story is like all the, the old stories, like the one adapted by Disney, <laughs> uh, uh, they were really negative stories originally and they were changed to be positive ones. Like, like um, uh, what is the name? Um, um, this girl with this long hair and this tower. Oh, Rapunzel. Yes, Rapunzel. Um, she. The end of the story is, is more than dramatic. It's like everyone dies and it's really sad. <laughs> and it was meant to to tell something to kids, something not to do, as a you know, as a as a way to drive them in the right direction, not in the bad one. Right. And so I do think it's interesting to see negative emotions as, as drivers. 
and so maybe they are actionable not to, not to fool because if everything is triggered from a fear perspective i don't think that it's constructive and uh, certainly people aspire to be more than just avoiding you know to be burned if you want to <laughs> grow uh, i think there is a different spin <clears throat> of how the action should be also equally i mean they should reduce the pains of course but also not forget the the other side every everyone kind of looks forward to to a better version of themselves like our original question we didn't say let's uh, avoid failures we wanted to to learn to be better designers right so could yeah. you take the same scenario kevin and then have like a have like a like a meter that you could slide between positive and negative and see how it changes that story and see which see which one i guess works better Can you repeat the question? Well, like, imagine that whatever you talk about, like the moral of the story, like, imagine a negative scenario, and then you have like a meter that you can slide to neutral or positive, and then to see which one generates the result you're looking for. Is that what you're saying? Mm. Uh, not, not necessarily, but to me, the fact that they are, there are, That the story generates negative emotions make the situation actionable in some way. It's like, to me personally, um, I write, uh, well, it makes me think about how I could do things differently when I am frustrated by a situation. And this is one of the factors that makes me act upon this frustration to me is a good driver personally i don't say that every everyone is working like that this is one of my drivers um and i never although we can think about that as something negative i perceive it in the end as something positive but the starting point was a negative emotion something like that you know it's like the story is negative but in the end people can see like the beauty of what it generated as an outcome and less the bad story in the end, something like that. I don't know. To me, when I hear the word frustration, at least I don't, I don't, I don't think I don't put the label of negative on top of it. I just think of like, like if you're in school, for instance, and you're like trying to learn something and you're frustrated because you can't comprehend it quite yet. Or maybe if you you have, you're working out or something and you're, trying to achieve some kind of goal. I just, yeah. to me, negative, it sounds like, like you're being chased by a bear or, you know, <laughs> someone coming after you. It's, it's, wow. like, it's like negative is like, you know, like, I'm talking cool, about you know. the negative <laughs> spectrum. Maybe you, the bear is, uh, you know, <laughs> high in the spectrum. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm too French to see frustration as a, as a, a positive thing. Uh, <laughs> Because French has, uh, too, has a, ten, a tendency to to see negative things everywhere, but uh, <laughs> maybe but, that's uh, yeah. another thing that's cultural, like yes. in the cultural context. Yeah, yeah but yeah. it's also the gorge of emotions. If you have too much of frustration, you cannot act. If you're too happy, you can not act. Mm. You need a right balance. Like think about you know uh, the kind of emotions that we create from. So designers, uh, you know, I, I read a few books that note at least once that designers are frustrated by a problem in the world. There's something that doesn't work. That doorknob doesn't open how you want it to open. You, you find something that's difficult. And as a designer, you think your way out of that frustration in a very creative act with, you know, any process you want to get involved. But then think about other ways to, to design your way out of your problematic state. So, for example, you got escapism, which could be, you know, a non-designer would drink or would take certain types of actions to take them outside. That is the also metaverse. Action. Yes, the <laughs> metaverse. But another thing that strikes me is the, the creative writing, which there are a lot of uh, writers who are depressed. So they create from one of the deepest and the most 
horrible feelings, I guess, the absence of many, many emotions. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think it's, it's finding that seed of action in these spots of non-action. I think that's the, the, the power of design. It's finding a way to grow outside because I think there are negative actions, but not like negative, no, actions negating certain yeah. aspects of reality. There are negative actions when you're doing something, I don't know, bad maybe. Uh, and then there are these actions in the, in the positive spectrum, which, you know, you're trying to maybe help someone or do something like that. Uh, but I think there's one particular that I've been reading about, which is the Tao the actual non-action, the, the spiritual non-action, where you're just so in tune with everything that you don't have to force yourself to act. Everything turn, becomes a flow. So I think mm -hmm. something action, then the whole world becomes actionable because you're in that state. So it's also about where you are in that, I don't know, emotional or mental or spiritual state that prepares the world, the affordances Kevin mentions. I think there's another gate opening to, to that space of actionability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I was, while you were talking, Diana, I was thinking of, you know, uh, in the music space, how, you know, the some, some things negative turn to be actually creative points for, for many, many artists as well. Um, and um, I don't know if it's uh, if I remember well, but uh, in in Brazil you have like a, a style of music, right? That is so it's is about melancholia or something like that, right? Is it right, Bruno? Yeah, uh, I think it's bossa nova. Yes, bossa nova. Yes, and it's really beautiful to hear. It's like it's yeah, in Brazil. In Brazil, we have. Uh, we have a lot of music that creates this, this really weird feeling about, I know I have this, this problem, but, and I have this melancholia, but I, I'm doing something with it. It's this something that will change something in my melancholia? No, but I'm doing something. So in some way it's actionable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We have, we have certain issues to me. It's, uh, it's a uh, uh, country music and it's really sad and, but it's actionable. So, at least you can dance. <laughs> Maybe almost like like I have noticed that if you like, for instance, if you watch a really sad film, it can like inspire you. If it's something like maybe that you can relate to, but it's it's more dramatized. I think it's more than what you would expect or have experienced. Like it 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 maybe can make you more aware of that's like not something that you wanted to do or it would prompt you to take action against something. I guess that's where it's kind of like, you know, um, if they had like a don't smoking commercial, right. And they had that person with a hole in their throat. And so like they, they amp up the could be scenario hmm. and you go, Oh yeah, that's not something I really want to experience. So that's what I've noticed at least within, when, when, when you go to some kind of event or experience, whether musical or video, if they can intensify it past what you know or experience it, that it like, it, as you said, it takes, you take action. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe a counterpoint to that is, you know, this, I don't know if it's the case in the US, but in, in Europe, you have on the uh, cigarette uh, packaging picture of, you know, people in a really bad situation because of their smoking habits. And it is proven to not work at all as a, 
trigger for stopping cigarettes or sm- stopping smoking at all. And and we have it. <laughs> yeah, and <laughs> it's it's not effective at all. But they are required yeah. to do it by law, so they do it. But it's not effective at all. And and the reason for that is people who bought the, the cigarettes package, uh, they already made the decision to smoke. And so whatever you put in front of them on this on this packaging is it will never be effective as a, as a way to counteract this habit. So you know it's like it's like a funny <laughs> counterpoint to <laughs> what we were discussing. <laughs> It is really interesting because, in a way, this kind of deludes this fear that you act through a, a fear place always. Because in this instance, fear is never going to stop any smoker from smoking. So they find, I don't know, a liberation or whatever they find in the in the cigarettes that really elevates elevates the experience to a point that oh, this fear doesn't matter. Yeah, it's it's more like context that makes people act upon awareness because it's not like with all the discourse about you know the danger the, the danger of smoking that people starting to smoke tomorrow don't know about the risk that they are taking by by starting doing that you know um, and and so it's it's not about uh, awareness alone is is never a good driver for change it's 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 never has been and it's would never be the case you need circumstances to actually you know provide the ability to change and 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 this is where i do find interesting to say it's something actionable is not actionable in itself but because of the context we perceive this thing as actionable Here's a question, um, like a story, for instance, usually involves multiple characters. Mm-hmm. And so instead of it being the main character, could could it be that maybe your frustration involves other people, like how it affects them or how it affects the storyline or your life, like if, if you're the main character. So instead of affecting you, how does it affect everyone else? Yeah, but that doesn't work either. I mean, on the cigarette packets, you have, oh, you're you're going to kill the people around you, your children, the fertility. So it's it's not about, it doesn't wake, wake a, a altruistic feeling. The, the actionability, I think, comes from, uh, I think, a degree of direct relatability. If you had something actually specific, which is not you're gonna die of cancer because you're smoking. They're like, yeah, sure, but how do how much do I have to smoke to get there? <laughs> like, you know, something more relatable is think about how much money you spend on a year on cigarettes. If I saw that on the on the cigarettes, I would have quit right away. I was like, this is stupid. Why am I wasting so much money? But no, I kept on smoking. So it's it's about again, what do we value enough to take action for? That's why I was a bit confused about uh, you know this practical value of actionability it's mm. like does it create value do you create value as a, an effect of it so if it's something that matters to you in that way maybe it has that degree in your case if you care about your children yes that might be the determining mm-hmm. factor to take action but i think it varies all the time that's actually really insightful. I mean, they, they should probably talk to you if they wanted to repackage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I, I think what, one of the things I mean, in, that right there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Wait, one of the things that's interesting is that we've, there's, there's this kind of arc that's happening between um, whether some kind of new knowledge or data or information is actionable, right? Like, like as a designer, like if mm-hmm. I'm taking this as an input, does it, you know, um, you know, does it allow me to, um, you, you know, do another iteration, for example, right? And then the other one is, what is the actionability of the designed object, right? Like, does this, does the object that we are creating provide a space for action and affordance for action, right? I think there's, yeah. there's a, it's interesting because we've kind of talked about both of those things and it's, Gone, it's gone from one 
kind of to the other. I mean, it's a continuum, of course, because because in some way a designed object can be information. And now we're talking about actionability on the audience side rather than on the design side. Um, and but it's it's an, I just think it's an interesting drift because it gets very close to talking about design as rhetoric, right? As a as something that becomes a um, becomes a, a catalyst for action, right? Um, on that on that note though, there is there was that famous study that was done um, about the uh, the towels in the hotels. I don't know if people are familiar mm -hmm. with this, but they did they ran. I can't remember what hotel chain it was, but they ran these four. It's kind of like an A B C D test about the language on it, and and it was you know you know help our staff by you know not. What was it like by, by using your towels more by reusing your towels, right? And that didn't do anything. Help the environment by reusing your towels that didn't do anything. But when it was formed, when it was the question was or the the, the text was formed in the context of social pressure. So, you know, do what all the other hotel guests are doing, and recycle mm -hmm. your towels or reuse your towels. It was the most effective. So there are definitely A, B tests out there about the rhetorical value of, in this case, communication design that have been proven to work. Right. And in that case, yeah. it was, it was kind of collective. It wasn't, you know, I'm only saying this because it ties to that notion of like, don't smoke because it'll hurt your kids, you know? And then when Diana said, well, how much do I need to smoke to do that? It almost sounded like a challenge. You know? <laughs> 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 but yeah, but but there is like the there are there have been tests out there that have um, specifically in kind of marketing and language and that that have proven that out. Um, and there's an entire history. I mean, strangely enough, direct mail is incredible for that. Like direct mail, because of the statistically significant sample size of what they do, actually is rife with that kind of experimentation. Right, knowing what people will respond to and what not, and they have the way that they code what they send out and allow you to do kind of large scale, kind of almost like behavioral economic type research on that. Um, that all exists. Like that's that's happening. Right, and that's that's kind of directly designed as rhetoric. Where there's a will, there's a way. I think that's important. Uh, now, I just want to loop into the, the emotions. Actually, it's not the emotions that drive actions. It's the will to, you know, act out or the will to the drive itself that kind of creates this possibility. You know, uh, there's Schopenhauer with the will to, to life, the, the will to, to just be, which uh, creates all this space of action and the need to take action. Because I think sometimes we don't have clarity over a certain course of action and we feel stuck in there and then you know kind of our brain is firing in another thing and all of a sudden you become productive in a different way like procrastination when you do anything but the task at hand just so like for example now my uh, way to action is i am creating something out of wire like i have a head and a leg <laughs> <laughs> And I've never done anything like this, but I'm trying to think what is action for me. So I'm processing this in a different manner. So I guess everyone has a different relationship to how they take action, which is actually more intimate than universal. Whereas there is, you know, testing, like Mark was saying about this A-B testing, which is useful for masses when you treat not, you know, you treat them as guests, not as human beings or things like that. You, when you call call them into or condition them to think in a certain way because that's what design does many times it conditions us to assume that identity but when you don't have to then you're in your own space yeah. to take action yeah th this reminds me the discussion around you know this uh attention economy and the thing go going on around this uh, idea of directing people's behavior through design. Um, but Diana, I have a problem with, with the statement you made about the fact that you need will to, to that will drive the action. 
because I don't know what drives Will. <laughs> you know, I don't know if it, it w which one comes, you know, prior to which, and maybe the fact that you have this kind of emotion makes your willingness to do something about it. Like everything's coming at the same type of moments, like in a, as a kind of a, a messy soap of <laughs> thing happening at the same time. I don't know, but uh, it's like, it seems like, you know, you, you need a wheel prior to whatever you find actionable. Maybe it's not what you meant, but. I don't know. That's the philosophical question for like 2000 years. I have no <laughs> idea. The chicken and the egg. Same thing. Okay. Oh, we know that answer. Don't answer it, please. Definitively, definitively, it's the egg because dinosaurs came from eggs prior to chickens ever existing. Therefore, <laughs> the chicken. But then, who came first, the egg or the dinosaur? Well, that's a completely different question. <laughs> but it's the yeah. more it's actually the more appropriate question because the chicken and egg question has been solved. But now it should be the dinosaur and egg question. Yeah. Mark, I, I actually, it all reminded me of a, a short film on Netflix called Social Distancing, and it, it was people in Zoom rooms. Like when it when it first started, and everyone was like, "Okay, what do I do now?" Watching that film was like watching my life, so it was very relatable. <laughs> right on. Um, on that note of dinosaurs and eggs, I need to move on. Yeah, I, I was uh, I was about to say we we. We we plan one hour and we we pass it from you know twenty five minutes so um, yeah I don't know what uh, how do we want to we'll try to synthesize this uh, yeah. for sure uh, I mean in, uh, I, think it's, I, I think it falls in the spirit of the uh, of the chalets in that it was uh, you know a little all over there at the start and then pinged off in multiple directions potentially related or not. And now the work comes in trying to make sense of the bounces <laughs> and the deflections and the other kind of physics of the conversation. But um, yeah, uh, thank you so much. Thanks everybody for your input. Yeah, thank you. It was really interesting. Thank you. Yeah, I loved it. So, next time. Yeah. yeah, so we'll try to publish whatever. <laughs> comes out of that uh, uh, on the on the community's blog and um, yeah we'll continue the the conversation in the next uh, session probably starting with a, a different word I don't know uh, one, that starts, one that starts with D so okay okay that's the challenge yeah hmm. do you want guys to propose some words now well not not now think about it <laughs> yeah and uh for those who joined the session but maybe are not already on slack uh, i can share the link to join the slack i don't know if you bruno and jared you are already you joined the slack channel oh no the no. slack uh, i can share the link no worries uh right now so uh, you can join and therefore continue the conversation with us asynchronously. Um, I see the Myro. Yeah. We'll, we'll link to that. Kevin will link to that in the summary that will appear. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I have that. I'm in that slide. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. So, nice right. to meet you. See you. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Take Thank care. you. Bye. 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 Bye for now.